All right, this is... Good morning. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome. We're starting day three with a live presentation from Dr. Roberto Sussman. I will add him now. Hi, Doc. Hello. How are you? Fine. I'm just uh, uh, finishing a few touches. Uh, <laughs> I'll, be ready. I'll be ready in a minute. No, that's uh, fine. We can talk in the meantime. Have you had any chance to watch any of the um, discussions on Scope? It, it's difficult because of the of the time lag, you know, of yeah. the time. And uh, uh, for example, I, I, I watched the um, in the first day up to uh, two o'clock in the morning when it was I was just uh, you know impossible to to yeah. awake, and so uh, that I had to. Uh, I missed a lot. I, for example, uh, I missed uh, Marewa. Mm -hmm. And uh, but anyway, the um, here here they are. The um, okay. I just want to uh, because one thing I, I would like to talk about today mm -hmm. is about third hand smoke, which is uh, one of the uh, inventions of uh, of our. Uh, friends yeah. in public health, and uh, uh, I, I would like to say before beginning, are we on the air? Yes, we are. Okay. So, John Summers from the UK says hello. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me just uh, insert some some things here. That's fine. Take your time, and then when you're done, share it, and then I'll bring yeah, it online. Inserting inserting one. A, a couple of, uh, of images, which uh, mm -hmm. the images are uh, self-explanatory. Uh, Hi, Liana. No, it's all good. I mean, you've got a little extra time today because there's nobody straight after you. So if we have to take a little extra time, it's okay. Yeah, that's right. It's, um, yeah, okay. That's uh, just one more and I'm ready. Um, I'm ready here. No, it's yeah. okay. See, the thing, what I want to explain to people is that there is a process. It's not that anti-vaping began now, uh, suddenly. No, no, no. It's an ongoing process mm -hmm. uh, that has its roots in the anti-smoking movement. So let me just put here a transition. I'll be ready in one minute. No, it's okay. If you know, if you want to, all the things that you've missed, if you go to the Scope um, YouTube channel, and this is for anybody out there, um, they're all broken out in today, and you can rewatch it. It's sitting out there. It's just going to be, you know, not live, okay. obviously. Um, Madawa kind of covered a bit of that yesterday because she discussed FCT, FCTC 5.3 and how it's used to cancel out or, you know, competitors. Okay. So this will be a good tie-on from her from last night. So this is good. Okay, now just one bit of text. The, this is called the e, e, um, e scope, right? Scope. A uh, scope with a with a small s. Small s, big c, o, okay. and p. And then live stream, right? Yeah, and then little e, and then live stream. Yep. E live stream. Yep. Okay. Just I uh, want to add this here in the introduction. And, yes, John, that is true. And uh, I will be ready in. Uh, it's okay. We're all pretty minutes. patient. Yeah. Okay. So we do it like uh, like the way we researched. I think it was it was very pleasant, and. Uh, the only thing is we have to be a little bit hurry, like not engage too much in in, yep. in conversations because then then the whole hour uh, goes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I, I'm, share I'm, your screen. Uh, Middle of the screen, share. Let me see where I can find. The, ah, yes, yes, it's um, share. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
shares only only screen yes and then um, it says screen sharing tips two monitors no i don't have two monitors i just share the screen share the screen and i'll bring it on okay now uh, uh, entire screen no windows and window is this one share okay okay i'm gonna bring what i'll do is i'll bring your screen on yes. i'll in, you know i'll let you do your thing i'm gonna come off camera i'll still be there yes. listening and if there's any questions do you want me to hold them until after you're done or do you want me to bring in questions from people as they ask them um if i'm on the middle of something then let let me finish the argument and then bring it okay right? All right, here we go. I'm gonna... uh, there's a lot of, uh, we play by ear. I think okay. just the discipline it. not to converse too much because then, then just that discipline. But we can play it by ear, okay? Okay, to love you. Yep, see. Okay, I'm going to go off camera. I am going to let you proceed and I will see you later. Okay, but are you going to introduce me? Yes, I will. I'm just letting you know that this is what we're going to do. Everyone... This is Dr. Roberto Sosman. He's from ProVPO Mexico. And today he's going to really explain to everybody where the anti-vaping mode has come from with public health and tobacco control. So Roberto, if you would, please, the floor yeah. is yours. Okay, so uh, let's begin the presentation. Okay, please uh, tell me if you can see my screen. Um, I can, I'm, let's see if everybody else. If people can see the screen. Should be. Um, is there any feedback? No, it should be fine because it's about the same size size as... Yes, yeah. Stephanie just said she can see it. So go ahead, carry okay. on. Well, uh, I'm going to talk about... Ah, here, sorry, an, er an error, a typo. It's virulent, not virulent, but anyway, what I would like to explain people uh, is that uh, the anti-vaping uh, push or offensive or war, whatever you want to call it, that we're feeling today, it didn't start with vaping. It didn't start with Bloomberg. It didn't start with uh, gland, uh, with it didn't start with the utterances and the popcorn long and Nevali and all these things. What we are experiencing, it's a process. It's a process that I would call, it's the decadence of a conservative and Puritan technocracy that has never been questioned, never been made accountable and that uh, they, it feels within this technocracy, the feeling is that they are waging a very just and very justified war uh, for, for improving worldwide health. It's like, it's like crusaders that were about to take Jerusalem or Constantinople, and they were about to massacre the inhabitants and all the infidels. But they themselves, they felt they were doing something good. They were, they were, they were following God orders or doing something good. Here, this is what we have. We, and, and vaping is it's a, it's a horrible infidel for these crusades. Vaping is something they are not able to handle because it they did not create it. And also, it was not created by the pharmaceutical industry. And this is what we are seeing, essentially. But let's see how things originated. Also, by comparing the tobacco and nicotine science with the normal science. I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist. And it's interesting to compare public health science with regard to, to tobacco and nicotine to physics, right? Okay. So, um, the science of tobacco harm reduction. Okay, uh, this is also an important uh, thing to know. Uh, this diagram uh, is not complete, but uh, it basically shows you uh, that this is a multidisciplinary 
scientific activity. It's not only medical doctors. You know, medical doctors, they, they have the, they know what they say and everybody else shut up. No, no, it's not like that. Uh, here, we have uh, an area of physic, physics and chemistry of the uh, aerosol that are generated by these devices, whether inhaled or exhaled. So this is physics and chemistry. Now, there is also pharmacology of nicotine. This is bi bi uh, biochemistry and physiology, etc. And then what we want to know is the biological effects from the exposure. Uh, these two do not answer that. This is answered here uh, by different people who do experiments in cells and rodents, and uh, also sometimes in, in human tissues, right, or in patients. Now, we don't know to what degree cells and rodents uh, are useful for humans. Uh, some, they might be, they basically uh, provide a biological plausibility, but not necessarily this plausibility will be realized like if you buy a lottery ticket then it's plausible that you might win the lottery but this certainly it's not certain now once in humans uh, patients in, in in a clinical setup you can examine the biomarkers of different compounds that are uh, that are toxic or carcinogenic and you find how the abundance of these biomarkers in the in the body liquids right urine saliva plasma then uh, there is also clinical tests in respiratory system uh, they, they there are different tests uh, and they are done on patients and then it's also cardiovascular you know there there are clinical examinations of people who vape how are the cardiovascular respiratory um signals etc so this is sort of in a clinical setup this sometimes is called preclinical now this is the area where medics doctors take care of right but they also need some help from biophysics and i mean biochemistry and physiology now here we have another different area of research which is smoking cessation smoking cessation uh, it can be tested by the so-called uh, randomized control trials, which are the so-called uh, golden standard of, med of medicine, but they can also be examined by cross-sectional, meaning cross-sectional means at the same time, lots of people at the same time, and it's retrospective because people talk about their past, so you can have some idea of how they evolved but you depend on what they tell you. This is retrospective. And then the prospective is a, a longitudinal where you follow a population of patients. And this is also basically done by medical doctors. But then you can also check smoking cessation by population, uh, census, by polls, etc. And here you, you have to use statistical methods, right? You are not following patient by patient but you follow population, so you need statistics to make sense of it. And then there is the other problem, the underage usage and gateway theories, and those have to be also tested statistically. So as you can see, there are lots of science involved. It's not only medicine, and medical doctors don't necessarily have the last word. Depends on where, right? Like medical doctor does not have the final word, on the physical chemical properties of the aerosols. Okay, so um, let's continue. Uh, how does physics and other disciplines compare to tobacco and nicotine science? Well, first, let's look at the external similarities. There, and uh, there are a lot, see, tobacco, etc., between TNN TN and physics. Okay, so first, both take place in similar institutions, universities, big government, industry, research centers. Both involve similar type of staff. You have a top researcher, you have a, you know, emeritus professor, you have tenured researchers, there, and you have junior researchers. 
And then you have the slaves, <laughs> which means the uh, postdocs and, and graduate students, which basically do a lot of the dirty work that these guys don't do. But of course, they, uh, they need the advice from the older guys, from, from the older people, right? So, but now both engage in similar tasks. What are the tasks? Well, you have to publish in peer-reviewed journals, you have to teach, you have to supervise PhD thesis and so on. And we uh, in physics do it exactly the same way that scientists, not all scientists, I'll explain, but spe especially academic scientists in tobacco and nicotine science do. Um, now, these are, these are external similarities and it makes it hard, very hard for people to people that are not involved, you know, people who don't care about nicotine or, or, or tobacco and don't care about physics, or maybe even, let's say, people who are outside of our bubble of tobacco and nicotine science. People do not, uh, uh, people see the external differences, and this, is, this makes it very difficult to understand the profound internal differences. Because once we go inside, it's very different. It is like if you have a, a real tiger and you have a human person with a disguised as tiger. Outside, they both have stripes. They look similar if the human is able to jump and roar and whatever. But uh, once inside the skin, you will notice it's a very different animal. Now, it's also very important to mention the job security of, of different people. Like, uh, in, and this is true in, in, in both. That's another similarity. Like, uh, some people have secure tenure, administrators, they also have secure tenure, technicians, researchers. The junior researchers are not, um, they might not get tenure. Uh, so there is more insecurity and so on. Postdocs and students have absolutely no job security. Their contract finishes and they have to go, they have no more rights. And even they can be dismissed before that if they are not working uh, the way they are expected to do. Now, Roberto? Yeah, sure. Can you explain what tenure is? Because a lot of people don't understand what that is. Well, tenure, is uh, when you are working in a university and you are doing research and teaching, lecturing, and so on, there, there comes a point where uh, you, you, uh, you have a, a permanent contract. That is, you, you, you uh, don't have to renew contracts every five years or every three years. And, and this is uh, having tenure, that you, are, you have a permanent position. This is essential. And uh, of course, in the United States, tenure has been every time they chew a little bit out of it. But at least in many other countries, you have tenure, you have a permanent position. That, that's the meaning. Another question? No, that was it. Thank you. Okay. So uh, to start seeing the difference, let's see how development, descent, and disruption work in these two, in these sciences. First, uh, some history. Uh, we have a, a timeline that goes from the 1970s to, to present day. Now, what happened between the 1960s and 1990s? Well, tobacco science was under a very intense development and uh, it was the time when epidemiological studies found a, an association between smoking and lung cancer, and uh, we have to put ourselves in that in the frame of that of that era, because before that, cigarettes were a very popular uh, consumer product, and it was real. It was like uh, apple pie, you know, like everybody smoked or. Or, or if not everybody, at least, you know, 50, 60% of the, of the population, adult population, especially males, used to smoke. And it was seen as in practically a harmless product. 
and it was very popular. Medical doctors used to smoke and the tobacco industry was a very important industry and so on. So to suddenly discover the association between lung cancer and smoking was a bit of a shock at that time. It, 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 was, it was a disruption. Disruption meaning that it, it shakes the system, right? Now, this work was very creative, was very good science, um, and it was mostly epidemiologists, oncologists, cardiologists, pneumologists, mostly medical doctors, right? Okay, so the people who developed this, their hope was that this new science would determine a new policy, a new policy of public health that was necessarily going to be very restrictive of the tobacco cigarette. And of course, that was going to uh, end in a conflict with that industry. But at that time, uh, in these days, it was a very, uh, people who, People were idealists. People were trying to serve humanity here and they were not powerful. Now, once it became clear, these associations, more people of other fields like lawyers and uh, public relation people, politicians, started to get interested in, the, in, in this issue. And then they ca came the tobacco wars because the more people uh, outside of this initial bubble of medical doctors, more people, lawyers, the public, even the public itself, politicians, uh, senators, public relation people, lawyers, they told the doctors, science, the, your science is fantastic, but it's not going to be sufficient. We need politics to change attitudes and to change behaviors. And then, of course, the tobacco industry didn't like that. It was very powerful and it opposed it. And those were the days when uh, tobacco uh, uh, industry executives were called for hearings in the Senate. And they tried to also they tried to falsify the science to say that, oh, no, we don't know enough. We need more time. Uh, you know, the merchant of doubt attitude that you have a very a very consistent and well done associate epidemiological association between uh, tobacco smoking and cancer and then they would say no but this is not correct and uh, you know tobacco science at that time was uh, was not uh, was not good science because it was a science with political aims trying to undercut and to undermine the new science that was saying that Tobacco smoking was the cause of, uh, and cigarette smoking in particular, was the cause of many, many illnesses. So there was a conflict and the tobacco, as we know, the tobacco wars, the tobacco industry lost these wars and they became a rogue industry. But the people who won this war became very powerful and they liked it. They saw that it's a, uh, it's a machinery, it's a technocratic machinery that receives a lot of funding from the government and also private. At that time, Bloomberg was not in the, in the area, but uh, there were other private funders and the pharmaceutical industry got in bed with them because, uh, you know, it's illnesses, so we need, uh, uh, we need medicines and so on. So it became a big machine, a big lobbying machine. And of course, science was also was not dropped out, but science was not no longer at the driving seat. Okay, so what we have, we have an attitude that says, well, science is settled. Uh, well, some details, uh, some tactical details here and there are still need to be resolved by science, but the but the core is settled. Is settled. Tobacco kills etc cetera, etc cetera. and now they devised the policy a set of policies to get rid of smoking and science was conditioned to support these policies it was upside down of what the original people believed it, originally science would determine policy 
But here, the other people who enter in this field and, and, and ended up forming a sort of lobby, a sort of technocratic lobby uh, that is allied with pharmaceutics and has lots of contacts with, uh, with the political system in the United States. Here I'm describing what happened in the United States. Later it spread globally. But at that time, it was mostly in the United States. And so a policy was desired and science was like a fig leaf, a scientific fig leaf to justify that policy. And of course, at that time, the, the medical doctors that were there, they were still on board, but there were so, social scientists, social workers, psychologists, lawyers, per, uh, uh, personal relations, uh, public relation people, lobbyists, and uh, they, these people became the demographic majority of tobacco control. Tobacco control was born there. Uh, tobacco control was born as a technocracy. It's a, it's a sort of, it's a bureaucracy with some technical aims that has a very specific purpose to impose a policy on a specific product which is the tobacco cigarette, and in general, the other tobacco products as well. And, that, and, and they had a, a goal to get rid of it, to get rid of smoking. It, it, was, it was like a terminal goal, of course. People know that there will always be a few smokers here and there, but to marginalize it to such a degree that uh, most people, like 96, 98%, would not smoke. And to do that, uh, many dirty things have to be done because you are talking about changing a behavior of millions of people, right? So then what happened in 2010? This machinery, this sort of lobby was already working like a very powerful locomotive because it involved jobs, it involves budgets, it had reputation, it was socially accepted. It had political power. And so they were in a locomotive very, uh, at least in the US, they were successful because smoking prevalence went down. And so what happened then? Vaping disruption. You have this powerful locomotive working towards Jerusalem in the crusade. And suddenly there is a problem in the rail tracks. Vaping. Wow. So this, uh, by the way, the tobacco control model in the U.S. expanded globally. And you can see national versions of it everywhere. Everywhere, like in the U.K. First, it, it's, it expanded to English-speaking countries because of closer cultural links with the U.S. Expanded to Canada, Australia, the U.K., Ireland, uh, New Zealand. But then it also spread to Europe and to Asia, less to Asia and Latin America more slowly, but it expanded. And then the, the cusp of all this was the FTCT, because the FTCT was the global implementation of this model through an, or, an organization that is international, the WHO. And it, 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 was, it is important because it is the first world treaty on health issues right it's a very important treaty and uh, it was essentially the formalization at the global level of the phenomenon that began with the tobacco wars and uh, when it is interesting because uh, it was uh, the drafting of the ftct began in 2003 but the final implementation was in 2005 and during two, these two days, um, the, um, uh, the groups, the one, the, some of the many groups that belong to the tobacco control technocracy in the U.S., especially NGOs like Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids and so on, they were basically telling the people how to write the FTCT uh, following the pattern of the United of the of the tobacco control in the US. Curiously, the US did never, never signed this treaty. It's interesting. Okay, so what happens with the vaping disruption? 
Uh, so most of the tobacco control, when I say tobacco control, I'm talking about a technocratic global machinery, right? Uh, for example, the, the medical doctor around the corner probably hates tobacco and probably, if he, et cetera, is anti-tobacco, but he's not a bureaucrat. He has his own private practice, so it's, that person is not really part of tobacco control. When I say tobacco control, I'm talking about a bureaucracy, about official employees, about NGOs that dedicate themselves exclusively to this issue, etc. It's a very, very multifacetic technocracy, right? So most of this technocracy rejected tobacco harm reduction. And then uh, we have, for example, the Orthodox majority, um, they thought that THR was a regression, was, was like uh, taking this locomotive and making it run backwards. Uh, and they coined these ideas that vaping was going to renormalize smoking because one of the tactics that that the, that this technocracy did was to denormalize smoking, to make smoking something abhorrent, to make smoking something like, for example, if I go in the street and I suddenly start uh, pissing or or shitting right in the street and taking excrement and throwing it to people, that would be disgusting, right? And so this is this is not normal. Well, they try to make smoking something like that, something that is so absolutely disgusting that it, we want it out of our sight, right? So they say that uh, because vaping conduct is very similar to smoking conduct, it would renormalize something that they wanted to have denormalized. And also they had to update their policy goals because if you look at an electronic cigarette, there is no tobacco there. So, and, and, the, and the claim is that we are delivering with vaping a cleaner, much safer uh, delivery vehicle of nicotine. So they updated the goals, uh, instead of being a smoke-free world, to be a nicotine-free world, right? And they continue with the idea that the fulfillment of the policy is what determines the type of science that will be produced, okay? now. There, is the, there was a dissident minority, dissident minority who welcomed the disruption. They say, look, uh, this uh, is actually giving more impulse to the locomotive, uh, making it easier. It favors the original anti-smoking policy. And they, of course, oppose this updating that, to make it an anti-nicotine, say nicotine is not the problem. And then uh, they also, went back to the original idea that the new tobacco harm reduction science would have to determine policy, not the opposite way. Now, of course, uh, we all know that there is a geographical divide, like the what I describe in the left is basically the dominant attitude in the United States. And in one country, uh, most of the dissident minority is in one country. There, there is maybe now New Zealand, maybe two countries. And I would say that countries like France and Germany, even though they do not support officially in Switzerland, Italy, officially they don't support a uh, harm reduction, but they are not hostile to it. So there is a sort of Atlantic divide. Uh, some places are worse than others, like not case, Australia is a not case. And Singapore and some Asian countries are also Taiwan. There are not cases. And uh, also, um, we have to say that within the US, there is a divide because most of the most uh, active, the most fanatic, and most uh, ideologically committed are liberals. Liberals, because liberals in the US are not like liberals in, in Europe. Liberal in Europe means somebody who wants a not so much mark, not so much government, a, a, a smaller government, and to allow markets to, and to all, and, and the government shouldn't be meddling in, in private issues of people up to a degree, you know. But the Democrats in the U.S. are more like the social Democrats 
in Scandinavia that believing that government has to control everything and solve everything. And uh, they hate corporations. They hate big industries. And so they, it's very natural for them to hate big tobacco and to, and to uh, assume the, uh, the policies that are on the left. And in, in the UK, it's different. So we had this divide. And of course, this divide creates a big conflict that is raging even today. But uh, the dissidents are a minority. And uh, OK, so um, let's, uh, let's see how the world is today among all the people who do science on tobacco nicotine. We have on one side pharmaceutic industries, the WHO. On the other side, they also, they also do research the major tobacco industries. Vapor industries also do research. They also do research on vaping. Then we have the government and research regulators, the FDA, the CDC, or the equivalents in the European Union, etc. Then we have universities and research centers. And we also have NGOs and charities like uh, Cancer Research UK, or in the US, you have all the American organ association, all these people, they are NGOs. And, and we have this very funny divide, <clears throat> like the tobacco industry is, uh, it's on, and the vapor, and most of vapor industries, they are, they are bad guys, right? And then on the left-hand side, you have the good guys. And here, well, of course, this is the American model, and here, this is the British model. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that THR is only done in Britain. It's done in, for example, tobacco harm reduction. Uh, it's also done, uh, research is done in vapor industries. In the UK, the government also has some body regulators. They also do research. Universities in the UK, probably now in New Zealand and in other countries, uh, in, in many other countries, there are researchers that will follow the British model. Even in the US, there are researchers like that. Now, we have this division and uh, we have some doubters because we don't know to what degree the people who are here are beginning to doubt. Uh, they, I, I, would, I call them the closet Gorbachevs. These are the <laughs> closet Gorbachevs that uh, today they, they, they parrot the official line of the Soviet Union. Well, this is like a Soviet Union, right? In many ways. So they are, and these are the defenders of the Soviet Union. And these are the imperialist powers, right? Yeah, so makes sense. We have this, these are the good guys. Um, these are the bad guys. And these are the naive idiots. This is the way, this is the way uh, the majority of tobacco control sees this division. And, and they think, they believe it. Where, where you might laugh and say, oh, this is, this is like caricature. Uh, this is not true. This is too, too gross. But no, that's the case. These guys, they believe they are good guys. I'm not saying that there are some cynics uh, some cynics who really want to get money or so, uh, a character like Glantz, who I think, I think that Glantz is a cynic uh, and other guys, but there are many guys who they see themselves in the mirror and they say, I'm, I'm a good guy. I'm fighting bad guys. And there are some naive idiots. They're naive. They're not really so bad, but they are idiots. They really don't understand. And I'm a good guy. I, I'm like uh, like John Wayne, uh, say uh, fighting villains, or I'm like uh, the um, D D E A fighting Mexican cartels, or whatever. You know, yeah. they're good guys, yeah. and that's the way they feel. Okay, so the tobacco. Uh, um, are there any questions? Because I, I'm. I think there is uh, room here for some questions or some commentaries. You do have comments. You do have comments. Um, 
when you were talking about the way they treated smokers, the comment came up that, yeah, ah, the de demonization, dehumanization, and disenfranchisement of people. Um, and that public health has never really been about the health of the public. It's always been a political animal. And then, um, and also purists versus pragmatists. Liana um, wants to thank you. She said, this is the most comprehensive explanation of the machine I have ever had the pleasure of hearing. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So it's going over well. And uh, I'm omitting many details because uh, otherwise it can be two hours talking about details. Like newcomers like Bloomberg. Bloomberg is a relatively newcomer because that's something interesting that as smoking is demonized and denormalized in the U.S., you don't see smoking in... in well, depends. If you go to Texas or Montana, you might see some smokers. I, I know that as a personal experience uh, because I, I'm, I'm still, uh, I still smoke a few cigars, a cigar every three days or something. So one day I can smoke cigars in Texas and when I've been there. But go to California or the East Coast and light a cigarette, it would be like shitting in the street or like spitting to people in their faces. You know, you mm -hmm. really become slums. And uh, uh, then, uh, but what happens when you win the crusade? Because these people by 2010, they were winning. Smoking was denormalized completely, almost completely. Smoking prevalence went down very rapidly. So what happens then you start getting less and less funding. People are becoming to be less and less interested in your health crusades. In fact, around 2010, some people uh, started saying, well, smoking is already done. Now our problem is obesity. So we need more money for, take some money from smoker, from anti-smoking and put it in the anti, um, junk food and diabetes and so on. And, uh, and so they, they were, it, were it not for Bloomberg, I think that they have slowly become defunded and the vaping uh, disruption would have fared better. But Bloomberg came and Bloomberg was like a shot of new blood to these people, right? So uh, now let's see the tobacco industry, how does the research, how the tobacco industry does research? What I can say is first that tobacco harm reduction disrupted the industry very much, very much. They started losing and so on. But because it's a consumer product and the tobacco cigarette is a consumer product, the tobacco industry can adapt to it. So they ended up welcoming the disruption. They did not create it as opposed to, to the propaganda and to the false history, uh, the narrative of the WHO that everything that we do, the vaping and, and hit the tobacco product and tobacco harm reduction is a creation of the tobacco industry. It's the opposite. It disrupted the industry and the industry uh, thought that after all, we manufacture consumer products so we can manufacture a new consumer product. And they entered and uh, they ended up welcoming the disruption. Now they manufacture non-combustible products and they have expressed a long plan to replace cigarettes by these new products. Now, tobacco control hacks uh, and fanatics, they say, so why don't you stop selling cigarettes now, tomorrow. But that only shows how ignorant are these people of economy. economy. You know, these tobacco control people, they think that uh, it's just a matter of denormalizing this and, uh, and, and uh, putting bans here and raising taxes and that's it. They don't understand economics. The tobacco industry cannot do that. They have to do it gradually. And they have expressed plans to do it. Now, tobacco industry research is very similar to research that physicists do in any other industry. 
because physics also does industry, in, also does research in industry, in the NASA, for example, or in General Motors, you will find physicists, or in Tesla, etc. And, the, and what I'm going to say is that the quality of the research that the tobacco industry is doing now is absolutely superb. There is no comparison. When you compare two papers of the same subject, one made by University of South Carolina or tobacco controllers from California or from whatever place you want to say, you compare with the same subject with a tobacco industry paper. Tobacco industry paper is way above in quality. And why, why is, is this? Because it became such a rogue industry and the, and the research that they were doing was so outrageously political and, and so suspicious that they, uh, this ended up forcing them to uh, exert good quality. If you are under a microscope all the time, then you behave well and you do the best. So tobacco industry research is excellent. It's as good as the research that is done in physics. The same quality, because I'm going to say it without shame. Physics is a very well-organized science and we are subjected to scrutiny and publishing is not easy and you have to stick to facts, right? Okay, and tobacco industry is becoming like that. Uh, nevertheless, it's a rogue industry and it's, it's excluded, but it's excluded because of political reasons, not because the quality of the products, the, the papers that they do. Now, in physics, disruption and dissent are natural. We're trying to disrupt current knowledge, but uh, it is also and uh, your disruption has to be, it's also harsh in testing disruptions. Like for example, I don't know, a Nobel prize was given because of the discovery of gravitational waves, observation of gravitational waves. And then here comes physicist Roberto Sussman and says, no, 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 that's not true. I, I have another theory. Well, I would better have grounds in what, what I'm saying, because if I disrupt in a silly or incompetent way, that's it, my re reputation goes to the rub rubbish bin. So you have to be very careful. If you disrupt, you better have good arguments. That's why uh, there are not so many disruptions, but there are disruptions. There are changes, shifts of paradigms. If, we, if one day we discover that uh, we finally have a theory that can explain cosmology without dark matter. And after uh, 60 years, we really don't find dark matter. We will need to have a shift of paradigm. The same shift of paradigm that happened between Newtonian physics and relativity. See, Newtonian physicists believe that light was traveling in a medium that they called ether. But uh, the experiments show that ether didn't exist. And the velocity of light and the velocity of light is constant, a universal constant, and that light can travel in vacuum. So it was a paradigm shift, right? But uh, tobacco control science, uh, the orthodox one, the dominant majority, they hate disruptions. They hate disruptions. If you are disruptive, if you are not following the line, you're marginalized, ostracized. It's a Soviet Union of health. It works like the Soviet Union, right? You've got 10 minutes. Okay. Science for us, science is only settled and it is a it is settled by consensus and it's always unstable. Let me go here fast. Technical quality in physics and other science overrides conflict of interests. Results must never be the predetermined. Uh, and so you see, it's very different. Funding, 
funding controls the direction and scope of science. Like if science is a machinery, uh, funding is a fuel. You might have a beautiful machinery, but without fuel will not run. Or you might have lots of fuel, but no machinery. So it's a combination. And the difference in physics to, to awarding uh, uh, funds depends on, on your technical quality. In physics, if you have technical merit, then you're funded. You know, there is also politics here and there, but it's never like in tobacco science. In orthodox tobacco control science, funding is determined by the capacity to advance predetermined regulatory policies and, uh, uh, and policy determined science as, as happened. Now, I, I just want to show you some images. Uh, what we are experiencing from this uh, technocracy is basically the upgrading of what, of what was done to denormalize smoking. Here you have an anti-smoking ad in the 220s, and this is the WHO propaganda. Look the similarity. It's very easy because they've done this for smoking. They want to do it for vaping. This, this is a technocracy. This is a locomotive that still wants to go on. And now vaping is the target, the way smoking was the target, okay? And then one thing that they, they thought about smoking, like in the third hand smoke, they thought that smoking would traverse walls and that smoking would also go from one floor to the other. And essentially the science that supports all this is it's pseudoscience because you are assuming quasi-magical properties to a substance. And many people didn't protest. Like, for, for example, Professor Abrams once commented that, uh, yeah, we knew that Glantz was doing some bad, some, uh, some bad things and so on. But he never complained. Many of the, of the tobacco control, uh, the people who used to be in tobacco control that are now dissidents, they, they didn't complain when Glantz and other people were doing this crap science. But I understand them. I understand them because they, and they would probably, I, I, I'm not trying to put myself in their shoes, but it was a utilitarian benefit to say we're doing crap science and denormalizing, but it's for the better good. It's to end smoking. Smoking is so bad that I'm willing to tolerate and turn my eyes the other way, as long as, as smoking goes down. But the problem is that this pseudoscience is easily applied to vaping, right? It's another thing of this, another thing that if one, if one, um, if somebody smokes here, everybody is affected by secondhand smoke and thirdhand smoke. Okay, so thirdhand smoke, what is? It's, it's, let me say it crudely, it's bullshit. It's pseudoscience. It's a few, it's nanograms of residues of uh, somebody smoked and the next day uh, there is some residues and they claim that here, they claim that ventilation is not enough to remove it and, and that it can stay for ages and so on. It's all, it's all wrong. It, it, the detergent that you would use to clean up the wall would pollute much more than third hand smoke. Now, this article is interesting because they recognize that the belief, see, look at the title, beliefs about health effects of third hand smoke and home smoking bans. They show that the more people believe that third hand smoke is dangerous, the more people will support smoking bans at home. Look how intrusive is this. It's not that you cannot smoke in a restaurant in interiors, which I support. It's not that you cannot smoke in a library. I agree with that. No, you cannot smoke in the whole campus. You cannot smoke in the whole city. You cannot smoke in your house. And this is what these people want to do with vaping. This is the goal. I'm about to finish. Conflicts of interest are irrelevant for us, but uh, conflict for interests, uh, conflicts of interest are the way, the excuse 
to if you are a dissident then you have no money and somehow you get uh, a few pennies from from somebody who has a very indirect connection with the tobacco industry that's it that's it your tobacco industry and you are excluded and uh, and because this science i'm talking about journals editors that publish uh, tobacco science it's 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 rotten the whole system is rotten that doesn't mean that that everybody is rotten but the system is rotten there are exceptions and and dissidents still are able to publish in the tobacco journals i've been a referee in these tobacco journals so it's not completely rotten but there is uh, and it depends from journal to journal but it's very difficult to publish there are okay historical precedents let me go here very fast i'm about to end historical precedents it's uh, the soviet union lysenkoism uh, stalin's favorite biologist was trofim lysenko he imposed on soviet biology the political and ideological strictures to comply with stalinist dogma so it was a predetermined science stalinist dogma had to be obeyed and the biologists had to provide evidence for that see so it's very similar to this orthodoxy and here we have for example here compare lysenko is science with orthodox tobacco control science both of them have an end time goal for for lysenkoists it was soviet world supremacy and for this uh, orthodox tobacco is the eradication of smoking and nicotine both of them have political masters here the lysenkoists the masters were the stalinist regime here is the global health technocracy and billionaire funders like bloomberg so these are the masters right the ones that put the funds and everything both of them have big satans they need big enemies they're totemic absolute hypergalactic enemies so who were for the lysenko is western power imperialists uh, tobacco here is the tobacco industry now inner enemies well there were all some soviet reformers and pragmatists that said yeah we are socialists but uh, things shouldn't be the way they are they should be reformed they were regarded as traitors and inner enemies and this is the way that thr researchers are regarded they are regarded like naive or like people that lost their way in in the best case in the worst case maybe like traitors consequences what was the consequence of lysenkoism decay of soviet biology and food production what is the consequence of this orthodox tobacco science is the stagnation and or increase of smoking in lower and middle income countries they are not working well we see in rich english speaking countries how smoking prevalence goes down but in many other countries it has stagnated and in asian countries is increasing because in asian countries we have the phenomenon that tobacco industries are national and they provide revenue to governments so this it's a stagnation how did it end well in the 1950s there was a total discredit and ousting of lysenko and associates they were removed they were thrown out of the window and uh, and changes what will happen here we don't know but i'm confident that sooner or later there will be some implosion and some changes in in this panorama right so i think i will i will end here um, okay uh, i i i have more material but i think i think i will end i will end here because this is another subject so okay. i will end here and uh, if there is time we'll answer we'll happy answer all the questions hi roberto let me put my camera on um, you know, I, everybody has been commenting, um, you know, that this is very educational, which it is. Um, and they're also asking if these presentations will be made available and they will be. I, you know, it's, it, it's interesting, you know, listening to you and the, after listening to Mottawa yesterday, you know, the machine, I like the, I like the analogy of the machine and the locomotive. And, you know, when you were talking about countries that, you know, were 
for THR and countries that were against THR. I don't know if you're aware of this, but yesterday at the COP, um, they chastised the Philippines for not going along with the plan. And then they also sent out a notice to all of the signatories and the people that were involved that it basically came down to you either play by our rules or otherwise, you know, we're going to bully you into doing it the way we want it to be done. Yeah. I see cracks, you know, and it's a long haul, but I do see cracks. Liana wants me to thank you for your presentation and she looks forward to hearing more from you. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, I will see you probably same time tomorrow and we will have another topic and we did really well and we kept it under an hour. So thank you, Roberto. Yeah, tomorrow will be a different subject. I'm going to show uh, and I would like to make it educational. So yes. the average vapor has elements to reply on signs. Yes. I'm going to explain things in a very educational way and we'll cover all sorts of signs, except one that I will devote for the following presentation, which will be environmental. Yeah. Environmental no, vapor. You've succeeded today because everybody's like, wow, we understand this. So full credit. Full credit. Okay. Yeah. Thank people, you, Roberto. Ask people to send me questions by email. I will happy be happy to uh, to address anybody sending me questions by email. Okay? Yeah, absolutely. And anybody who came in late, you can re rewind back into the live stream to watch the entire presentation. And you will see that um, Roberto's email scrolls on the bottom. So... Once again, thank you to the audience for joining us. Thank you, Roberto, for joining us. I will see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, same time. Bye. Same time. Bye. Bye.